Uh, I'm Simon. I've been writing Perl for a long time now. Um, and I've got very into Perl 6 in the last couple of years, um, this year especially. Um, I'm currently working at Zoopla. We are hiring, and that's not how nice I'm about hiring. I saw an E there for a second. Cool. Um, but we're, our, our, bit, our office is full, so you might end up sitting on my lap, which would be a bit weird. Um, and I've, I recently wrote a Perl 6 module, so I'm quite happy about that, so I'll put it out there. Uh, I am here to make the bold claim that next year will be the year that people start using Perl 6 in production. I am fully aware that this sort of claim <laughs> has been said before. But I really do think so. And what I'm going to go through today is a few things that I think um, really make the language stand out. I do think it is now production ready. And I think there's a few things that it does that are worth having a look at. So if you haven't tried Perl 6 yet, hopefully some of these things will make you think, oh, that's great. Um, and if you have, maybe it'll give you a chance to look at it again. Because, yeah, I know it's been in production for a little while, but really it is now a point where it's, I think it's ready. So without further ado, let's go on to some stuff. So one of the first things about it is um, it gives you multiple different ways to program. You can write functional programming style in Perl 6. You can do fully object orientated with roles and multi-methods, which are lovely. You can do reactive event-based programming. The, um, the supplies, channels, and promises, the asynchronous nature of Perl 6 means that you can do some really powerful stuff with that. Um, if you are a fan of strong typing, you can stick types everywhere in Perl 6. And if, on the other hand, you're a fan of good old-fashioned duck typing, you can go with that as well. It's not picky, it's, but it is really good. And if you do use typing, it does give you um, a little bit of extra speed boost. The, the compiler can like, make some bits a bit faster. So that's always nice. Um, so yeah. Rather than being the Swiss Army chainsaw, Perl 6 is the toolbox that lets you build your chainsaw to be what you want. You can basically create whole DSLs in it. It's really impressive. So uh, one of the things, I gave a 15-minute talk at the London Perlmongers meeting a couple of months back. And people said to me, oh, what modules are there? So I went and had a little look. And ListUtil is one module that gets used quite a lot if you're doing Perl because you know, there's a few things missing, like reduce. Um, that isn't in Perl, so you use ListUtil because it's all built in stuff. So what I went was, was, you know, can I reproduce everything in ListUtil in Perl 6 without too much work? And the answer is yes. OK, I didn't do the pair se section because you don't need to, because pairs are now an actual type. They're an object, pair objects. When you use the fat arrow, you create a pair object. You're not just, it's not just a fancy comma. A um, couple of fun little bits I wanted to point out up here. The, <clears throat> so I mentioned reduce. Uh, you now have the reduction meta operator, the square brackets around the plus up there. Um, so if you use a reduction meta operator, you can basically put any other operator within it and then a list on the right hand side and it will give you a list or give you a value on the, uh, the left hand side, which is your reductions being applied to it straight up. So you can do it to do a, uh, an add or you can do it to do a, a product with a star. Um, or you can call the reduce function, which takes a block. And I, I had to put in the three stars there because I crave pain. Um, if, you, if you use a star where a block is expected, then it will automatically generate a block. And it will create um, positional, uh, what's the word, variables within your block for each star. But the middle star can't be, there can't be a variable there. You need an operator after you've got a variable. So it goes, well, it can't be a whatever star, so it must be a multiplier. Now, if you want it to be a bit more legible, just use the Unicode multiplication symbol and then it won't. Um, other fun ones is junctions, but I'll be covering those in a second. One little thing, so is the Boolean cast operator. So if you've got something, you do so on it and it will return you the, the thing. Uh, any, anybody got any questions about this slide before I move on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, add, uh, can, can the add actually be written as star plus star like that without spaces around the plus? Possibly not. Did I skip my disclaimer slide? I think I got rid of it, actually. Um, yes, that might actually break. I, I did actually have a disclaimer slide. I took it out. I probably should have left it in. Uh, I've checked. I've tested most of these, but I may have rushed. Uh, no, I don't. But I think I tested. I may have, I may have removed the spaces when I put it through. Um, everything I, I will try and make sure everything I say today is correct. Um, but I am still learning Perl 6, so I may 
uh, misrepresent some things or some things may change because some bits of the language are still cha changing. Pretty much every code example I put in the slides I have tested, so, but as Ephraim says, that, that may be wrong, very possibly is. I have been known to make mistakes. Uh, so, junctions. I love junctions. Um, junctions allow you to test multiple, uh, multiple values at once. So here we go, we've got an array of three falses, and then I set up a, three junctions. Now I'm using the junction uh, creators here, but you can also use, um, down, uh, down here, there's operators let you string junctions together. These ones are more useful in tests. By the way, these are all these three lines down the bottom here, totally valid. There's only one other language that will even try and accept that, and that's JavaScript, and it only works by accident. Sometimes. Whereas that, Perl 6 just goes, yeah, fine. Whatever, knock yourself out. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so our first one all will return true if everything in the array is true when we do a so on it to test it. Uh, none will return true if nothing in the array is true, so it's returning true in the second case. And any will return true if any in the, uh, anything in the uh, array is true. So that's where we get false, true, false. But then we change one of the values in the array and our junctions we don't have to redefine them. Our junctions are looking at those values in the array. So when we test them this time, now the any one's returning true because one of the three values in it's true. Now that's, that's kind of, I don't know, that's a bit interesting, Simon, but, so, but I, 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 I had a little bit of a mess around and I came up with a, a thing that I thought was quite fun. So here we go. Validating a Sudoku puzzle. Now I went with a four by four puzzle because it fits on a slide better, but this is totally viable thing to do on a nine by nine puzzle. So what we do is we first set up three one junctions for all of the uh, values going across. So these will basically be testing that one of the values in the junction matches the thing. Now this is the thing, see, because junctions don't have to have true or false values in, and I'll show you this in a second. Uh, now the next slide is subtly different. As you may notice, I've swapped the C and the underscore, so we're now going down the way. Uh, and this is, uh, so now we've set up another four junctions with, again, looking at four different values. Um, and I'm pushing them all into a test array. This will become, the, the, the logic behind this will come along. So assume that the same things are going in. And of course, in the actual code, this isn't two loops. I'm not that dumb. Uh, <laughs> final one, we then set up four more junctions for the squares. So now I've got 12 junctions that are looking at all the possible things you have to test for a valid Sudoku puzzle. Now, I create one more junction. Now, this is where it gets a bit bonkers. So I take the test array and I put that into an all. So when I do that, what I'm going to be doing is, and the next line is then doing the test. So for each value between one and four, I see if, test, uh, if the test all junction returns, like, has a true value for that, because I'm then reducing it using the reduction meta operator to add together all of these, check, these tests. So it would be true for one if in each of the one junctions, one only occurs once. Okay, one wasn't possibly the best word to use for that description, but the same for two. If two only occurs once in all of the one junctions, then the all will be true for that one. By testing all four of them and then reducing across, this only returns true if it is true for all four of the numbers. It's not true for that one because that's not valid to document the two and the one at the top, if you rotate them around. Um, so this is the thing in its whole horrible glory. Again, not the best of code, so it's not actually in separate, it should be in a library and stuff. But the, the whole point is just to point out it works. So this side over here is <coughs> setting it up. You've got the test up there, you've got an output function, um, and then we swap around the two cells at the top and we do it again and it returns true. Um, and I'll run that at the end if we've got time, but it does work. And this is the thing, so we're doing 48 tests against our, our thing with one call, and it's threaded. The system will automatically thread it out across um, the, the various junctions. So you get really nice and fast. So if you're needing to make lots and lots of tests on this kind of thing, then junctions are really worth a look. Uh, promises! Everybody loves promises. Well, everybody who's done any JavaScript um, and needs to have to deal with callbacks, promises make life so much easier. And Pulsitz has got promises. Um, so this is just a nice little thing demonstrating various types of promises. We start with a start block, um, which has got inside it a sleep three, and then it prints out, or a simple start. 
We then, our next line, we, oh, and it, and we, def we get back the result of that start block, which is a promise. And you can check that promise to see if it's been kept, which means it's finished. You can then look at the result of it. If it's been broken, which means something's gone wrong, or if it's still, uh, I can't remember the technical term for it, but it's still going. Um, so the second promise, we use uh, the in constructor. So what that does is it creates a promise that after uh, two seconds will be kept. So the then constructor takes a promise, is, is, or is a, is a constructor on a promise that will basically fire off when a, a promise when that completes. So there we go, why not use a timer? There we go. Like, next one is using the any of constructor. The any of constructor is a bit like the um, any junction. What that does is as soon as any of the promises it's been given complete, then it does, then it completes itself, and then the then block after it fires off. Finally, we do the all of, which is looking at all three of our ones. Now, of course, the any of will trigger as part of that. So the all of is waiting for all three of them to fin finish. And then finally, we print out the first bit. And as we run it through, oh, and the await, very useful function. Await will basically, you give it a bunch of promises, and it won't do anything until all the promises have completed. So there we go. Asynchronous programming without having to think. It's brilliant. But... Channels and supplies is where it gets really great. So this is a bit big and complicated, and I, I, I totally understand that I shouldn't be writing massive uh, slides of lots of code, but I'll take you through it. It'll make sense. Um, there's a slide explaining the really cool bit. But what this is, this is a, um, a function that will go into a folder, and you pass it in a... Oh, it's actually a script. Note that it's using submain with a uh, um, signature. So it's expecting a text string to be passed into this script. Uh, and what it does is it looks in the directory you're in, puts those all into a channel, which is a first in, first out queue, so you can just read items off it. Now, quite frankly, that channel could be an array, but I wanted to show off channels, so that was the point. Um, and over here, we'll, so we'll, we'll, we'll flip, don't worry about this side of the thing for now. Over here on the right-hand side, we loop through our channel, polling it and getting paths out from the directory. If the path we've been given is a directory, so that's path.d, it's very similar to the dash d uh, test that you could do in uh, Perl 5. Uh, if it's a directory, then we do a directory on that path. So we do a dr command, which basically gives a list of all the things in the directory, and send those into the channel. So the channel gets filled up. And like I say, totally could be done with an array and a while loop, not a problem. Um, if we... <coughs> get a file, we have the second channel, file channel, we send the, send the path to that. And then we just carry on going around. If we pull and nothing's out, which means the directory spidering has stopped, we've run out of things to spider, then we mark both channels as closed, which means that any, any events that in them will go through, but then the channel will say, right, that's done, and then we go last, and then we wait for these readers. Now, what are readers? Well, I'll go on to the slightly bigger thing, the secret source. So here we are, we, we've got our file channel, and we get a supply of it. Now, a supply is a event queue. And the supply is basically, if you're listening to the supply, an event happens, you will get it. Now, the interesting thing is, if you get a, a channel and you get the supply of it, then it will, um, if you get multiple supplies off the channel, unless you use a share function, which means that they all get the, 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 the message, the supplies will divvy them up. Now, these will be running threaded in the background asynchronously. Great. So what we're doing is we're mapping and we're basically getting a path in, path.lines, so lines basically opens our, our file because uh, the paths are actually IO objects, they're not just straight strings. Um, opens our file, reads them in, individual lines returns you an array, uh, then we get, we grep that, we look for, now, initially when I was writing this, right, they had a regular expression in and that regular expression was causing complete crazy pants explosions due to multiple levels of threading. So I took it out, and I'm going to go and try and investigate it further next week and try and work out exactly what I did wrong. Uh, so at the moment, we're just looking to see if the text exists using the index command, because that returns uh, an undefined value if the text doesn't exist. Boom, boom, boom. And then at the end, so that, that gives us an array of lines where the text we're looking for exists. And then we return that as a pair. Remember I said about how uh, fat arrow is a pair. So we're returning the pair with the path on one side, the list of lines on the other side. And then we have a tap. So note, this is all on the same, this is all the same line. It's chained on. Uh, we have a tap 
A tap basically reacts to an, uh, an event happening. So the tap comes in, it gets the data. Now the data is a, a pair, so data value is the lines. So we loop through our lines and say, and the key is the key, so that's the path. Uh, if you do, if you do a, uh, if you've got a path uh, I/O object and you do a, a, a string thing to it, it just returns you the string version of the path. It doesn't go crazy. So that that basically prints out the line. And then the final thing we do is we get this done message. So when the channel that this supply has come off is closed, the supply gets given a done uh, message to be told you are not going to be taking any more uh, events. So the done message fires, uh, or the, the, the done event handler fires, and what this does is we have these readers that are promises. Um, now, unfortunately, I didn't keep that line in here. So we've got it in this loop, which we do eight times. I did define children and then not use it. Well done, Simon. Uh, <laughs> in this loop, which we do eight times, we're defining an array of readers. And again, I could have pushed them on, and I could have used closures and stuff, but just doing it with indexes was easier. Um, we define a promise. And then we keep the promise when our supply is done, because you can't await on a supply, as far as I'm aware. I'm pretty sure you can't. So that's why I was using promises for the await. Um, so what that gives us is this eight event handlers all handling from a channel as we're sending messages into it. Um, so you're getting multi-core processing, asynchronous. It's lovely. It's still not as fast as uh, finding grep. But you know, if instead you were doing web requests to, for instance, Salesforce and getting back 100-odd uh, URLs that you then had to make queries to in order to get additional data for things, plucking something out of the air that I may have had to do a few weeks ago, um, then something like this, where you're more being constrained by network latency than you are by disk speed and such like, can be quite good for getting you to be able to do all that stuff until they break limit you. Uh, more fun stuff. Sequences. Everybody loves sequences. Lazy lists, what, what is not to like about lazy lists, and rational numbers, or lazy evaluation. So here we go, we're defining a prime uh, number uh, list. So at prime's there, if you ask for any uh, index in it, it will return you the prime number at that index. It's really simple. Um, we're using the is prime uh, function that the integers have. So that's nice and simple, just defining it like that. Uh, evens. If you, if, you give it, if you give it a few elements in a sequence, it can generally just work out what you want to do with it. It's pretty good at that. If it's more complicated sequence, like the Fibonacci sequence, then you need to actually tell it what you're doing. Um, I love this. That line there, my div 0 equals 42 divided by 0, will not crash your code. You can do a division by 0, and it won't crash your code. As soon as you look at it, it will. But you can even you can look at the two individual parts in it, because this is a rational number. So you'd ask for the numerator and denominator, and it tells you that you know denominator is zero, and you might want to do something about that. Using the nude function, which I'm sure somebody had a great time naming. Um, oh, and then I threw in that last line because I do like having these little lines that just go, hey, look what our language can do. Because most can't. Because rational numbers. Point 0.2 is stored as 2 tenths, point 0.1 is stored as 1 tenth, point 0.3 is stored as 3 tenths. So it just does it using rational numbers. We get a zero, like real people. It's lovely. <sighs> Sets. How am I doing for time? Oh, I probably should slow down. Um, <laughs> or have a small drink. So there's a whole set of... Set. Oh, God. Brilliant, Simon. Well, well good choice of words there. There's, there's yeah, the whole collection of set functions. Um, it's for, the, for set theory and such like. Uh, note, here I'm using Unicode symbols, but there are also uh, large, what, what is the, because the, the, we were calling them Texas, but we're not anymore, but ASCII, I guess. ASCII versions um, of the symbols, uh, of the operators. But because, and there's a slide later on about this, because Perl 6 is a Unicode enabled language all the way through, it uses, it can use Unicode operators if you want to, but there are ASCII versions of all of them. They just tend to be a bit bigger. So here again, we're defining our primes uh, array and we're defining our Fibonacci sequence. So sets are immutable and you can't just throw a lazy list into a set. It doesn't like it. You have, so here I'm saying, all right, give me a set of the first 50 prime numbers. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes, that's very true. 
time and time. I should have put a carrot in front of the 50, that's why. If I put a carrot in front of the 50, it wouldn't have done 50. But I'm dumb. Uh, then we're going through for the first six Fibonacci <laughs> numbers. And we're seeing, using the element thing to say, is this Fibonacci number an element of the primes? Boom, 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 boom. There's that. Um, and then we're going and we're using the intersection operator. Now, if you pass in a list to a set operator, it will basically coerce it to a set and then do the set operation on you. So that's basically testing the first 11. <laughs> Fool me once. <laughs> uh, first 11 values and giving us back the set of Fibonacci sequence, the set of those that are prime numbers. Um, yeah, there's also bags. Um, bags are similar to sets, except for they give you weighted values so that you can use them for various things. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not totally sure about their usage, but they seem useful. But like I say, all of the set operators, as far as I know, all of the set operation things are in there. Um, at some point, I want to do some uh, speed testing on it to see how good it is with like massive data sets because playing around with massive data sets is something that I think we all have had to do at some point in our lives, generally log files. Um, <laughs> here we have the one image in the entire slideshow. I'm not good at, the, at pictures. I'm very much a, a verbal person, as you may have noticed. Um, <laughs> but this image was created by this code. These, these lines of code were all that required to make this image. Well, that's not quite true, OK. Because the top line is use Cairo. Um, and there's a, couple of, there's a couple of lines. of So if you look at the rectangle, you've got right ping. Now, right ping calls another function called right to ping. That's important, because in the next slide we see here we have the rectangle uh, function and the right to ping function as they are defined in the Cairo library. OK, this is in the Cairo uh, Pulse 6 library. Both of them using native call to speak directly to the, the Cairo C library. So if you're having to use C libraries and stuff, if you're having to write XS in order to communicate with C libraries, in order to do fun stuff, you really want to look at native call in Perl 6 oh so very much. Because it's that, it really is that simple. I, I, and I'm terrible at C, was throwing together some SDL demos a little while ago, which were quite fun. But then I found Cairo even easier, and I didn't actually have to write the native call stuff. The only complication here is um, the value of Cairo lib depends on whether or not you're on a Windows machine or a Unix-based machine. So that's why it's got Cairo lib in. And there's a bit of code at the beginning to work that out. Um, but really, it's very, very simple to do native C. Or if you're on a, a JVM, as I'll mention later, uh, native Java library interaction. Um, and I'm sure there, there, are, there are people who know much more about this who can give you much more information. But it, I'm trying to whet your appetite, trying to make you go, ooh. Uh, yeah, roles. I love roles. I think roles are one of the, the best things in Moose, um, and in like in the, to come from the whole Moose and uh, Perl 5 object thoughts. Um, I think they make inheritance so much easier to do. Um, and there's some stuff you can do with them in Perl 6, though, that just is even more fun. So we'll go through this. So I'm defining a, a, a role called logger, which has got one, uh, one method on it. And then creating an integer. And then using the dot question mark syntax to access its log message uh, method, which, of course, it doesn't have. It's an integer. And I've just created log message on logger. And integers aren't, aren't loggers. Now, dot question mark, if you call a method using dot question mark and it doesn't exist, on the object you're calling it on, then it will just return nil. It won't error, it won't warn, it will just work. Really, it will, trust me. <laughs> um, then we use the does function. Now, what the does function does is it composes your role into the object you give it to. So now your object is, in this case, if you ask the, for the Perl representation, it will return back saying it's an int plus logger. And it's like two bits. Except I think I'd actually call it a non-something or other because I just created it in the code. Um, so then when we call the second dot, dot question mark log message, now that one will actually log because now that, that five has got a log message method. Um, now, I think this is actually quite an interesting concept for if you're, you know, you're building a big bit of code and you want to do, for instance, um, occasional um, 
checking on values and stuff. So like basically logging and stuff. You want to do something like that, but you don't want to do it for every object. You maybe want to pick one in every 100 calls and flag this thing and say this should log. So this lets you do it by basically you write your code and you put in your logging lines wherever you would put the logging lines, but you don't have to go, is the log environment variable turned on for this request or anything? You just do it, write it, boom, with a question mark in. That's the only thing you have to do. And then when you create the object, you go, oh, this is the 100th time we're going to do the, the random logging, you know, uh, whatever, you look a bit dodgy, we're going to log you. Boom, add in the does, does and it works. Now, there's a, there's a um, thing called Lumberjack, a uh, module called Lumberjack, which has much better logging than my amazing logger role, but this is the whole case in point. And on that note, but, zero but true. Who's used DBI? Everybody's used DBI. Somebody's used DBI. You must all know the joyous zero is zero, which is zero but true, because we have no rows, but the, the, the request didn't fail. That's how you can write zero but true in Perl 6. But you can do that with lots of different things. What you basically do is, <clears throat> but works slightly differently to does, in that when you do, a, and I've mostly found this out by experimentation, when you do a but, um, it takes your object, and then takes the object, the, the other object you give it, and when you call the type method, because casting in Pulse 6 basically works by calling type methods on objects. So for instance, you'd normally do, if you wanted to know if zero, what the Boolean value of zero would do is so, you'd do so, but so does a zero dot bool call. So it calls the bool method on zero. So what this does is it overloads the bool method, basically, or overwrites the bool method to say, instead of returning what you would normally return, Return me. True. So I am zero, but true. But you can do it with all kinds of stuff. So again, gives you that ability to kind of mess around with things a little bit. And I thought that was kind of cool. Not as cool as the Sudoku solver. That's my, you know, I should have put that later on because that's my favourite bit of the whole slideshow. <laughs> uh, oh boy, that's very small. Okay. Um, yeah, this is the lot. So I, I gave a talk, like I said, a 15 minute talk. Um, I, I talk way too quickly, I've just realised. I gave a 15 minute talk at uh, the Pearlmongers, London Pearlmongers, a few months ago, and this is the only slide left over from that. Um, and what this is doing is showing that Perl 6 is a fully Unicode like compliant language. It really just gets Unicode. So, what I might, why am I have to. Oh, uh, so what I'm defining at the top there, my first line is, now what you can't see is that A has actually got an acute on it. That's $A acute 1, and the second one's $A acute 2. And the first one I define with a single Unicode code definition point of uh, Latin A with an acute. Then the second one I define as being an A followed by the combining Unicode character for an acute symbol. Pulse 6 goes, fine, there's a, there's, a, there's a letter for that, I'll just make it into A acute. Um, if, if, on the other hand, you try and slam in a combining thing that there isn't a letter for, Perl 6 will go, fine, OK, I'll just treat that as one letter. And it does. It, it will then go, right, these two are now together, so I'll, I'll treat them together. And when you split them up and stuff, they don't fly apart after that. Because a combining diacritic, or whatever they're called, needs to have something to combine to. It's kind of cool. Um, so we test that they're, we, we print them out, they're the same, we can uppercase them, and it, and it does it properly. And that's lovely. Um, this final line, unfortunately, is so tiny, tiny, you can't see that I'm doing using three quarters, um, the three quarters Unicode symbol, uh, to multiply by my AE thing, and then I'm squaring it using superscript 2, because that's a valid operator. <sighs> so I've learned a very important lesson about, I think it's mostly that the text is a bit lighter. I will note that multiplying 2 by 3 quarters and squaring it still exists 2.25. It doesn't go into crazy float stuff. So that's all nice. Uh, <coughs> so, I've, I've managed that in half an hour. and I, I, I did actually give this talk on Thursday and, and I did, did it in 45 minutes. So obviously I'm talking a bit faster with less coffee, which is strange. Um, so there's a few other things that I will quickly run through, but not in a huge amount of detail. Uh, grammars. Um, I would really love to have had a slide on grammars, but I still don't quite get them. They are really powerful. They have to be because they are what passes the language to compile it. Um, 
they are basically regular expressions on steroids. They, they let you do all kinds of stuff. So it's a, um, yeah. But like I say, I need to sit down and, and work through with them for a bit to use them, but very powerful. Uh, oh, imaginary numbers, because some of you might find that useful. You can do imaginary numbers in Pulse 6 and just, they work properly. Um, it's got exceptions, actually got exceptions and try catch blocks. Hello, yes. Yes. Uh, I think they're. I think they're built. Yeah, they're built in. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no there, there's nothing. Nothing I've really talked about here, apart from the Cairo library. That's the only external library that I have used in this whole thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, built in. Built in imaginary numbers, um, because you know, Perl gets used in a lot of places, like in sci scientific community and stuff. So that's that's useful. Uh, plus, having rational numbers that work is nice as well. Um, yes, proper exceptions. Try catch blocks. Uh, that's all in there, so you can actually, you know do things properly, that's nice. Though eval does still exist. They haven't managed to kill it. Um, CPAN. So there's two things with CPAN. One is that it now is the official Perl 6 repository for modules. So if you, if you write a module for Perl 6, you can upload it to CPAN. Um, and the Perl 6 module installer will look in CPAN and find it. And that's where they're basically recommending you do it. But also, there is a module called inline Perl, which lets you if you've compiled your, now you have to have a properly compiled Perl 5, um, whatever, executable. Um, but if you have, then you can basically do inline Perl 5 in Perl 6. If you really have to, if there's a bit of code, like a module that you need to use or something, you can use inline Perl to do it. And that's in CPAN. Uh, well, the modules are in CPAN. I don't know if the inline Perl, I don't know. I'm too asleep to answer that question. Uh, there's a whole mess of object sy syntax, uh, so you can do some really crazy stuff with classes and, and objects and build them all uh, however you like. Again, I haven't really got into that too much, so I'm not sure of the exact details, which is why there isn't a slide. Um, but, but like I say, Perl 6 is basically written in Perl 6. So there needs to be a meta object protocol in order to be able to write Perl 6. Well, it's written in Perl 6 and a thing called NQP, which is not quite Perl, which is like low level and stuff. Um, the telemetry, this is great. This has been added recently. So um, you have the Rakudo compiler, um, uh, which compiles onto various virtual machines. Uh, More VM is the one that's specifically written for um, Perl, like Perl 6. And then you've got it, the JVM, which I've mentioned up there as well. The telemetry only exists in the More VM with the Rakudo compiler, I believe. Um, again, disclaimer that I said earlier. But what that does is it basically lets, it will do snapshots of your CPU usage, your memory usage, all this kind of stuff. You can turn telemetry on and it will give you, at the end of your run, a snapshot of all of the information, which again can be quite, quite useful. Sometimes the people in suits like us to be able to tell them this information with graphs and stuff. So there we go, built in, lovely. Uh, JVM, yes. Um, so JVM support in Perl 6 goes up and down, it has to be said. Um, because the generally, I think the the like the point releases. So you've got six point C coming up to six point D. Those mostly are, are pretty stable. The problem is what generally happens is that they'll be worked on on the more VM, and then somebody will go back and fix the JVM stuff. But you can run Perl six on the JVM, and eventually, you know, that will be the the goal will be solid production level <laughs> Perl six on the JVM. Um, and I know that there are some people, again, who wear suits that will be really happy about that because they love the JVM. It's great. <coughs> and I guess there are nice things like telemetry plugins for it and stuff. Um, Rakudo.js, I don't know if anybody's heard about Rakudo.js, which is uh, compiling Perl 6 to JavaScript so you can then run it in like Node or on the browser. Um, that's on about, I think it's like passing 80% or something of the test suite. So quite a lot. Because this is the thing, Perl 6 is defined by the test suite. It's the, the, if something make, meets the test suite, then it's Perl 6. That's the definition of the Perl 6 specification, which I like. Um, IO notification. Uh, that's a very nice little, again, it, 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 it is an internal module. And what this does is you point it at a folder or a file. Um, you basically, you point it at a path. And if anything, huh, anyway, where was it? Where was it? Yes, IO notification. You point um, a notification gives you a supply and then when you read off that supply you'll get file events 
So if there's a file modified, if there's a file being renamed, these are currently the two events that it will send out. You get those and you can see that something's happened to that file. Now I'm currently um, writing a, a little project to basically wrap the IO notification supply and add a manifest so that when you create it, you point it at a directory and it's going to be aimed at directories. You point it at a directory and it will take a, a snapshot of what's in the directory at the time when you create it. And then when the notifications come through, it uh, will basically check that file against the manifest. So it can give you some more information rather than just saying, for instance, like if you create a file, you get a file renamed event. So this will instead say, file's been created. You know, I think that's a little bit more useful. So it's like wrapping the supply in another supply. And it'll be lovely. Um, when it comes out will depend on when I stop playing Skyrim again. Um, <laughs> Date and date time objects built in, so you don't have to like import any other modules and stuff um, using Gregorian calendar, I think, mostly, um, before Zephram asked me any questions, because I know you love dates and times. <laughs> but they're built in objects, so that makes life a lot easier. Um, and lots more. Uh, every time I was looking through the, the documentation to find something, to, like, I was going, I'm going to do something with channels of supplies, I start reading them, and then I go off and uh, it's like, wait, there's a whole, because supplies have got a whole load of, effectively, you can do loads of different list, sort of mappy, greppy, reduce, well, I don't know about reduce, but um, there's like things like a unique thing you can put, a uh, method you can put on a supply, which will return a new supply, but this will only send a, res a result if it's not been seen before. Um, and there's one that's similar, but you can give it a, um, a timeout, so that it basically, it won't return it if it hasn't been seen in the last X seconds. Oh, I didn't mention that. Um, earlier on, there was a sleep method that I put in with like a sleep of three. That could have been 0 0.3 and it would have been fine. You don't have to have a, t a, a separate module to be able to do less than second sleeping. Just, you know, I should, have, I should have mentioned that. So there we go. I'll throw that one in as a last little point. Um, but yeah, every, every time I look in the Pearl 6 docs, I find something else. Uh, there's, there's lots to it. Uh, so here's a few, a few other things to look at. I'm not doing too bad time now. Uh, so firstly, the docs. Now these slides, uh, I think, are, should now be linked on the on the site. And I, if anybody wants, I can give them a copy as well. Uh, so the, the documentation, definitely first place to look. Um, lots of different bits in there, all linked. And you can you can. It's a bit like TV tropes, but for Pearl. You can find yourself going off into strange corners and going, "What is this? What is going on? It's great." Um, so High Unicode in Perl was a talk given at the APSE conference that I nicked some of the bits out for one of my slides. Um, so that explains a lot more about Perl 6's uh, Unicode. So well worth watching if you haven't watched it already. Um, Perl 6 Superglue for 21st Century was, I think, also given at uh, the Amsterdam conference. And again, well worth a watch. Covers a lot of very interesting uses for Perl 6 is like command line sort of superglue language, which is I'm sure many of us have had to do crazy command line Perl messing around. Uh, think Perl 6 is a book by O'Reilly, which is, I think, a rewrite of a book called Think in Python, which is um, a programming, it's basically it's a, like a, a learn programming using Perl 6. So it's about teaching you algorithmic, like how to think like a programmer. Um, so Probably a little bit low level for a lot of us, but it is quite useful to just give you a lot of the, like, the low level grounding on how things are done in Perl 6. So it's quite a good read. Um, using Perl 6 has just come out recently. My copy arrived in the office uh, last week, I think. Um, and that's 100 programming um, like tasks, like little programming things. The last one's doing a brain F. Um, because we're being videoed, I don't want to swear on YouTube. I probably already have, but I don't remember. I lived in Glasgow too long. But anyway, but, uh, doing a, a whole thing in Perl 6. Um, but yeah, there's 100 different bits. They're quite useful. I nicked like Fibonacci series and prime number stuff from that, amongst other bits. So that, that's a good little read. Uh, learning Perl 6 um, is in development at the moment. And this is basically uh, by Brian Foy. And it's going to be the, the, the llama book, but with a um, butterfly on the front. So, you know, buy many copies, give them to your nieces and nephews and young, young people you know so they can become proper programmers before they get java uh, Crow, uh, by Jonathan Worthington, is well worth looking at. It's currently on version 0, 0 0.71, um, but they are moving towards 0 0.8. And what this is is a microservice framework using channels and supplies. Um, 
it's very fast, it's very um, interesting to use. Uh, one of the fun things I like about it is that their plan, it, it's all using environment variables for configuring stuff and the plan for the 0 0.8 release, one of the things is, is it in it is to have it that when you use the stub command to create your little stub fault thing, it will create you a Docker file straight up. So you, if you're wanting to be building microservices that you're going to throw into Docker and Kubernetes and all this kind of stuff, Crow is built from that on the ground up. Uh, Bailador, which is a similar web service um, thing, more I think more aimed at making web pages run services, and I believe there's a talk about it going on today, but I think it's going on now. So, um, but again, worth a look. Sparudo is a, I mainly I went through and looked for any kind of vaguely production useful Perl 6 things in, in, like out there at the moment. That one's for doing, um, manipulating servers and like doing, so it's like Puppet and this kind of thing. So you can go onto various servers and update them to whatever level you want, written in Perl 6 or has, Perl 6 plugins. Um, Spitch is a shell script compiler, but it apparently seems to be in a hiatus at the moment. But it will basically, you can write some Perl 6 and it will compile it into bash scripts. It's a bit weird, but it's kind of cool. Um, and then finally, I threw this one at the bottom, which was a talk given by Curtis Poe about roles, because I, I skipped over roles at the beginning and go, they're great, but if anybody here hasn't used roles for inheritance, watch that video. Really, it's the bit where he shows you the BBC uh, inheritance tree, the B the, uh, which is like multi levels high, and then he had like the whole problem with like things inheriting from other things just so they could have an audit tr function and crazy stuff, and then it rewritten into a single flat tree with one superclass because it's DBIX, and then everything else is underneath that. Um, yeah, questions? We got ten minutes, so this should be fun. <laughs> What I will do, I'm going to prove that the language does actually work by grabbing this. Here's one I prepared earlier. Boop. So there's the, there's the Sudoku uh, thing. I can show you it running. As you can see, it's, it's pretty, fair, pretty fast. Um, so one of the things I would say is if you're going to do, if you are writing any Perl 6, write modules um, because it's a bytecode compiled VM uh, language. So if you write scripts, so for instance, the Sudoku junctions, if I time that, that's I think comes in about 400 milliseconds. Um, but most of that is compiling it because it's not in a library. If on the other hand, it was calling a library and it was just one line, that would drop the speed on the second run because the first run, it would be compiling the library. But the second run, it would have the library pre-compiled, would be able to use that nice and quick. The other fun thing is it will run time on it because there is, there is a fun bit, I can prove it. Uh, da -da -da. Um, so we've got, oh, turn a second, turn a second. So 200 there, but the user time is actually higher because, of course, as I said, threaded. It's actually used all of the cores of the machine to do it. If I run, I, I, I'm like, I'll do thread grep because that's funny. Uh, so data. Simon can't type either. Doesn't help that it's not mirroring. So, so what I've got here is a bunch of folders, and in each of those we have a bunch of uh, files. And if we look at one of the files, they're all like that. <coughs> because, you know, if you want to do testing that, that kind of thing. So, and I did, I think ThreadGrep is now in, uh, no, so. Uh, passes, two, did I get a slash? No. Doing this without being able to uh, see the screen is always fun. Um, someone pick a number. Seven. Okay. This is this is uh, seven. Look for lines without seven. Not with that because it's doing an index. <laughs> I could I, I could it would be easy enough to do it, but. That's not what that one's doing. Um, but if I do like a slightly bigger number, like that might not work. I don't know. I've not tried it with six. I've, there you go. See? Um, no, I, can you just see up in the top there? You've got, um, I'll just move the mouse right up here. Oop, he says that there. Yeah, that's my CPU usage. <laughs> Whee! Um, like I say, 
finding the rope is still faster. But if this was, again, doing web requests and pulling the data down, then <coughs> different thing. Uh, cool. So, yes, questions while that runs. Anyone? Hello, sorry. Yes. Does anyone have any idea what the status of the learning um, I, there was a picture printed recently, it's about that thick at the moment of, uh, in A4 printout. Um, it, it's quite good, I've, I could find out, I've got it, because uh, I, I did the Kickstarter so I'm on the GitHub for it, but I don't have that to hand at the moment. Um, that's still going, yeah, that's going to be going for a while, so. But no, it, it, is, it is quite, quite close I think, he's just finally tying up. Yes, hello. Uh, what's the state of the native? Um, I think it's basically the same as the the C. I think it just works, you know. As in, yeah. What what you do need to look out for is there's a few libraries that are not thread safe, um, and one to, one really annoying one is libssl. Um, so if you're trying to make requests to secure sites in threads, it can go a bit pear-shaped, unfortunately. Unless that's been, I don't know actually, hmm? No, Crow doesn't, Crow's not using it. Crow's, um, Jonathan wrote his own async um, uh, socket interface instead. Um, so that's the thing, if you want to do HTTP requests, use Crow, HTT, or Crow TLS instead for it, because that is actually thread safe. Um, yeah, any, any other questions? Or, yep, yeah, hello? Uh, let's see, following on from the book question, yep. uh, for Pro 5 programmers moving to Pro 6, yes. Um, I don't know if there really is one right now. I think if you're, if you're a Pro 5 programmer going to Pro 6, the first thing you want to do is look, well, is look at the, da, 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 he, he says, what's, um, yeah, if you look at the docs, um, and there is actually there's like six I think um, FAQs of five to six translations. So there's one of like the whole what about this? What and then there's like a whole bit about what what there's a, there's like a few global variables that don't exist anymore. Don't play around with the ink array because it doesn't exist, and the thing that does exist for it you really don't want to be touching because it's all to do with pre-compiled pre files. Files use lib. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I would say go and look at dogs.pl6. Uh, so I maybe I know. may be buying some more books before I go home. Brilliant. <laughs> Any more questions? Hello. I'll do you and then I'll do you. All right. Uh, Zephram, yeah, yes. Uh, uh, on the uh, uh, rational stuff. Yes. You were talking about rational numbers just working, but you were using the version of rational numbers that doesn't just work if it eventually gives up. If it, the denominators get too high. Yes, okay, this is very true. Um, if, you, if you go with a really large denominator, so you end up with a very, basically very small number, the, you, it does flip over to floating points, and I believe there is a big rat as well. Very small number. Oh. You, can do, you can do like 1.2001, and that, that's beyond the limit, and it'll go to floating points. That's pretty small to me, but yeah. No, this, this is true, yeah. So, um, you need, to, you need to be aware of that if you are really playing around with the rational number stuff. I think for what most people will be dealing with it, it'll be fine. But there is, uh, there is a big rat, isn't there, or something that will... It's fat rat. Fat rat. Uh, there we go. It and then it does. Yeah. It there we go. Fat rats. Thank you. <laughs> uh, sorry, you had a question. There we go. I've got two minutes, so... I was just going to ask if there's, yep. is, there, is there then no penalty for using inline cell 5? I've not really tried it, so I can't really answer the question, I'm afraid. Um, as far as I'm aware, it's not a huge amount. Like, say... I wouldn't stick it in a promise or a supply. <laughs> but well, actually, a lot of work uh, go into uh, making inline pro five uh, fast as possible, and we actually have an almost daily uh, benchmark that we. Uh, put Where are the benchmarks? I knew they were somewhere, but I couldn't find them. And or I would have put a link. Uh, test T and the. I'll come over a bit because I've got a microphone on. So the um, for a te 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 text CSV file uh, using the XX version of 12.5 by itself, 
takes half a second and the same amount uh, of stuff using uh, inline pool 5 inside pool 6 takes 12 seconds. So it, it is still about uh, 25 times as well. So if you can write it in pool 6, do. Um, I think that's me out of time. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, <laughs>